All right. So DNA structure, going on some review, digging deep back to unit one, head on over to the quick right in columns E through G. Answer these three questions. DNA is which type of macromolecule? Oof, that's a long time ago, unit one. DNA is what kind of material that stores information? And what are the monomers for DNA called? DNA is a polymer. It is made up of smaller units called monomers. What are those smaller units called? Give me your best guesses if you're unsure. An educated guess is better than no guess at all. You can do it. I believe in you. Awesome. So there are four macromolecules. We got carbs, we got lipids, we got proteins, and this last category to which DNA resides, nucleic acids. Awesome. The NA part of DNA stands for nucleic acid, written right in there. All right, and yes, DNA is a genetic material that stores information. It is considered the blueprint for life. If an organism is alive, I guess even dead organism, if you are an organism, you have DNA, you have that genetic material. It's necessary for life. And got a few more people typing. Got some guesses and some sure things. Any guess is better than no guess. All right, so in each of our macromolecules, they are made up of monomers, individual units that when put together give us our polymer, in this case, DNA. And for DNA, they are made up of nucleotides. Hooray, yay, great job everyone for remembering. That was deep cut, I understand. It was hard to reach back in your brain, but it's helpful. We're on our way to studying for that final. Okie dokie. So these next few slides are directly from that uh, macromolecule slideshow. Great review, but let's get into it. So each of those nucleotides, so our monomers of our polymer DNA, has three parts to it. We have that nitrogen base. Let me get my pointer. Oh, come on. Don't do this too much. Too. All right. We have this yellow thing hanging off the end here. Uh, it is either a hexagon by itself, or it's a double um, hexagon and pentagon. Um, that is our nitrogen base. It is a ring of carbon and nitrogen. A couple hydrogens thrown in there, but mostly it is nitrogen and carbon. It is attached to this green pentagon here. That is our sugar. Pentose sugar, meaning it is five. It's got five carbons in it. And in terms of DNA, our sugar is deoxyribose, that D part of DNA. We're not gonna get into RNA until after the break. Um, so just kind of ignore that ribose part. But DNA is deoxyribose is our sugar. That's why it's called deoxyribose nucleic acid. And those sugars, our deoxyribose sugars are attached to phosphate groups, these little white circle things here. So we got our phosphate groups attached to sugars, which are attached to phosphate groups, which are attached to sugars, which are attached to phosphate groups, which are attached to sugars all the way down our backbone here. We got our nitrogen bases kind of hanging off to the side, chilling, doing their nitrogen base thing. Whoops. So these nucleotides, our monomers, have two categories. There are two different types, and it is all dependent on those nitrogen bases, those things hanging off the side. We have purines, which have the double ring. So looking back here, uh, at the top, our very top one here has two rings. That would be a purine. Our purines are adenine and guanine, A and G. The way I remember this is that 
looking at our periodic table, the symbol for silver is Ag. So A and G are purines because they are pure silver. Hopefully that works for some of you. Others may not, you just have to memorize it, sorry. Um, and pyrimidines are single rings. Purines are double, pyrimidines are single. So again, looking back here, um, the second one down is just a single hexagon. That would be our pyrimidine. These are the two leftover bases, cytosine and thymine. Um, thymine because we are looking at DNA. Again, you can ignore this RNA part. Um, we're going to get into RNA after the break next semester. But when we do, your cell is a pyrimidine. Uh, that's the category it is. So we have purines, double ring, pure silver, A and G, pyrimidines, single ring, the leftover to cytosine and thymine. So let's stick all of these together, all of our little nucleotides to make our nucleic polymer, our DNA. We have our phosphate groups attached to sugars, attached to phosphate groups, attached to sugars, attached to phosphate groups, attached to sugars, attached to phosphate groups, and attached to sugars, and all the way down and down and down. These are really, really strong bonds. These are covalent bonds between those phosphate groups and the sugars. It's super important that they're strong because they are the backbone of our strand of DNA. Then we have our nitrogen bases just like chilling, hanging off to the side. But those sugars and phosphate groups need to be super strong. They got those um, covalent bonds. Now looking at our nucleotides, so those are the nitrogen bases of our nucleotides, the things that are hanging off the end. They are hanging loose because they need to bond with a complementary nitrogen base. Purines bond with pyrimidines. Pyrimidines bond with purines. You don't get a double purine or a double pyrimidine. It doesn't happen. Purines are always with pyrimidines. Pyrimidines are always with purines. You need one of each. And these are connected with hydrogen bonds. This will be important in a second. Looking at our A's and T's, our adenines and thymines. Between them, there's only two hydrogen bonds. So if you look here, there's only two dotted lines. The other two, G's and C's, they are bonded with three hydrogen bonds. There are three dotted lines here between them. A's always bond with T's, T's always bond with A's. So they will always have two bonds between the A's and the T's and the T's and the A's. G's always bond with C's and C's always bond with G's. Therefore, we will always have three hydrogen bonds between G's and C's and C's and G's. Looking at our two strands together, so they've been bonded by that hydrogen bond between our two nitrogen bases, our A's and T's and C's and G's. And this will create what's called a double helix. Double because we have two backbones, our sugars and phosphates, and helix because it's in like this weird spirally twisty structure. So double because there's two strands, helix because it's twisting and spiraling. Again, those hydrogen bonds are joining those two strands. So the C from one is bonding with the G from another. The T from one is bonding with the A from the other. And they're connected by those hydrogen bonds. Our DNA is the code for building everything, like proteins. Proteins are so vital and important to the functions of living organisms. We're gonna get into protein synthesis next unit after the break, um, but what we need to build those proteins is in those bases, those A's, T's, G's, and C's, that's a code. And that code will tell um, our ribosomes that are making our proteins. So thinking back to our organelles, we have our nucleus, which holds the DNA, that code, and it passes on that information from the DNA to our ribosomes which then create our proteins inside of our endoplasmic reticulum, which then passes off to the Golgi body, which then prepares it to be shipped out of the cell to wherever it needs to go. So looking at our two strands, they carry the same information no matter which way you read it. If we know that the T's pair with A's and the A's pair with, pair with T's, and we only see half of it, we only see one of those strands, we know exactly what the other side is gonna say oh, one half says T, we know the other half is going to say A, and vice versa. Oh, one half says G, I know the other side is going to be C, 
and vice versa. So it's really important that we know that these bases pair with each other so that we can predict and read the other half if it's split. Why would it split? Next week, we're gonna look at DNA replication. We're gonna duplicate that DNA because of our cell cycle, which we talked about last unit. Oh, look, dividing cells, that looks familiar. So why would we need to, to replicate that DNA? Well, if we're splitting into two exact same cells, might be important that we have the same information. We can't make those organelles, we can't make those proteins unless we have the entire code. All right, some vocab. This should sound slightly familiar from last unit, um, but we're going to use it all again. So here on the left is a nucleus. So inside our cell, we have nuclei. Inside that nucleus, we have something called chromatin. When we're looking at our cell cycle in interface and the beginning of prophase, we have that weird squiggly, noodly, stringy stuff. That is chromatin. Then once we get the signal to start that cell cycle, G1 phase, okay, we're gonna start replicating our organelles. We're gonna get bigger, make more cytoplasm, yada, yada. Move on to S phase. We're going to replicate that DNA, which we're gonna talk about next week. Then we're gonna move on to G2 phase, prepare for mitosis. We're going to go into mitosis. In prophase, we're going to create those chromosomes from that chromatin. So we're over here at chromosome on the far right. That chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids. So here in the middle, we have chromatids. They are half of that chromosome. So if you remember in metaphase, our chromosomes line up along that metaphase plate in the middle of the cell. We have our spindle fibers coming from the centrioles and attaching to the central mirror. So down here, this big center middle spot of the chromosome is called the central mirror. And in anaphase, those spindle fibers are pulling apart that chromosome two and half into two pieces that are identical. Each of those pieces is a chromatid. It is half of that chromosome. I know, lots of chromos, C words floating around. Uh, on the notes, I believe I put a table of some sort um, where it has you match up names, vocab words, and um, definitions. Hopefully that's helpful. If all of this is confusing because they all sound exactly the same. All right, so now we've made our DNA. We have our double helix. Inside of our bodies, we are made up of cells. Cells are very tiny. We can't see individual cells with our naked eye. Inside of those cells, we have organelles. One of those organelles is a nucleus. So even smaller than things we can't see are even smaller things we can't see. And inside that nucleus, we have DNA. In every single cell, in every single nucleus, we have six feet of DNA. And how many cells do we have in our body? So our bodies are full of DNA. We are miles and miles and miles and miles of DNA inside of us. However many cells make up our body that are human cells, we have a lot of bacterial cells. However many human cells are in our body, each of those cells has six feet of DNA. That's a lot of genetic material, a lot of information. So how does it fit inside of that little tiny cell? Lots and lots of coiling, twisting, stacking. So looking at our diagram here, uh, we have DNA at the top, our little double helix here, and it's going to start twisting up on itself. And then these proteins called histones come in and our coil double helix starts to wrap around those histones, kind of like thread around a spool. Then those histones start coiling up on themselves to create little coils and stacks. And this creates something called chromatin. That should sound familiar. We just talked about that. Going back here, chromatin is that stuff that we can see, the noodly stringy stuff inside of our nucleus. Then that chromatin starts winding and coiling on itself and winding and coiling some more into the chromosomes. Finally, something we can see with a microscope. We're more familiar with that shape, but that's after so many times of twisting and coiling and stacking. Here's a different look at it. Um, our double helix, it's two nanometers. It's going to twist and coil until it finds these uh, histones, these proteins, and then it's going to 
wrap around those. And then those are going to twist and coil upon themselves until we get to chromatin, which are going to twist and coil upon themselves until we get chromosomes. Lots and lots of twisting and coiling. That's the best way to compact all of that information and all of those long strands of DNA. Here is a quick video. Um, you won't be able to hear the sound, but it's more of a visual thing. Uh, you're more than welcome to watch this on your own um, through the slideshow that I posted in Classroom. So here's our DNA. It's doing its DNA thing and it's going to start coiling around these histones, spooling around like thread around uh, a bobbin, twisting, coiling, spooling, Now they're going to start coiling and stacking on themselves. Here is our chromatin, that stuff we see in the nucleus. It's all stringy before we hit uh, prophase. Now we're going to continue to loop and coil and twist. Continuing to loop and coil and twist and continue to loop and coil and twist. So it's just over and over and over again, twisting and coiling and looping and over and over and over and over until we get to the point of chromosomes, those things we can see with our naked eye. All right, whoops, no, don't play. Just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, homologous chromosomes, more vocab. Homo means same, logos means information. So looking at our chromatids, they are homologous. They have the same information. So half of this chromosome is the same as the other half. They have the same stuff in them. And more vocab, ploidy. So each organism has a different number of chromosomes in it. We have different number of chromosomes than our dogs, our cats, our plants, bacteria. All of these have different numbers of chromosomes, depending on the species. Ploidy is that set of chromosomes. And we use prefixes to tell how many of those sets there are. Di, tri, oct, sept, etc., quad. Um, so you have to know your roots of prefixes to understand what a ploidy is of a certain uh, organism. Humans, hey, we know what those are. We are those, we are that. Um, we are what we call diploid, di meaning two. We have two of each chromosome. So it's kind of small, but in the bottom right corner here, we have what's called a karyotype. There'll be a bigger picture on the next slide. And for each set of chromosomes, they are the same shape, the same size. We have two of each. So A1, we have two. They're the same shape, the same size. A2, we have two, same shape, same size. A3, we have two, same shape, same size. And so on. For all of our somatic cells, Somatic cells are all cells that are not sex cells. So if it's a cell that is not an egg or sperm, it's going to have those uh, 23 pairs or 46 homologous chromosomes. Skin cells, blood cells, hair cells, whatever. As long as it's not an egg or a sperm, it will have all of these pairs of chromosomes. Here's another look at that karyotype. Again, karyotype is just the word to describe this sort of display of uh, chromosomes. Not be on the test. That's for when we go over genetics, just trying to expose you to some of these words so they sound familiar next time. All right, that's all I got for you. Comments, 